That's how we solved it. Because it wasn't Meatloaf singing. Right. It was just, oh, it was a soundtrack. We lost our boss. The recordings are great. You know what? Let's go in and remix this stuff. Let's take a lot of time on it. Let's record, record, re record some things that we a little quick on. And let's take a good hard look at the artwork. Cool. Uh, yeah. awesome. So, uh, first off, where were you born and raised? I was born in Plainfield, New Jersey. And I was, I was raised in Greenbrook, New Jersey. I had 52 students in my graduating class. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Really? Yeah. That's it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, you couldn't. Everybody knew everything about everybody. You know, it was like uh, Pleasantville, you know? Sure. Small. It was funny. I had wow. A, uh, I had 1,200 yeah. kids in my graduating class. I was here. I hear like over a thousand, you know, or I think, <laughs> think even more silly. I, I'm not kidding when I say this. I, I think the graduation ceremony was a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's wow. Yeah. So you, I mean, that is yeah. Small town. So you must've what known those kids from kindergarten through whatever 12th grade. Yeah, I still talk to a lot of them, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's Feel really awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with, with New Jersey and, and, but in the town that you grew up, especially like, uh, was that, were you fairly close to, um, like how close is that to New York or like to a bigger city where you would maybe, uh, catch music or something, or did, did bands come through your town? No, uh, we're about 45 minutes from Manhattan. You know, oh, okay. I would have, That's not bad. have to go to uh, the Meadowlands, a giant stadium. Oh, okay. To- Concerts. So I, I, you know, growing up, most of my concerts were either Meadowlands or Madison Square Garden. Okay. The garden was easy because we just hop on a train, and it took you right to Penn Station, right underneath the garden. So you just mm-hmm. get the train and go right up, right to the garden. It was great. I saw my first well, Kiss uh, Dynasty tour, and then I then I caught uh, Priest Maiden on uh, Vengeance and Number of the Beast tour. Oh wow! And then I caught. Uh, for those about to rock ACDC. Uh-huh. Yeah, those were all at the garden. Wow. I can't even, that's awesome. I saw I've seen yeah. um okay. I saw ACDC before, but I, I've saw when I saw Iron Maiden, I was so excited, but it was like the most um it wasn't them. It was the venue I saw them at. It was in Irvine, California. And it like the venue is in this like amphitheater, but the the grass I, area was like you've probably yeah. been there. Have you played there? Yeah, Irvine Meadows. Yeah, you know how it's got the hill? It's like super steep. We were at the, we, you know, my friends and I just got the lawn tickets and we were up there and we could be having this conversation at an Iron Maiden show. I was like, this is like so not what I owe. You know, I'm thinking now, I, I actually worked in, uh, I worked a Maiden show. Well, I was, I was roadie for Anthrax at this time. This was like 1989. Oh, wow. We did, we did our Meadows with Maiden. It was uh, mm-hmm. no perfect. I think that was probably the first time I was here. I've been there probably six times now. Okay. Yeah. This was years. This was like 2004, maybe. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, I was, I was so excited. But I mean, they were awesome. Don't get me wrong. It was just, uh, I should have, you know, my friends and I should have been cheap and we should have bought better seats. <laughs> maybe. Come on. Uh, but okay. So you grew up in New Jersey. What about, how'd you get into music? Did you come from a musical household at all? Not at all. I just, uh, I wanted to blow fire and spit blood. <laughs> was it after seeing Kiss? Were you like, wow, okay, this is what I want to do? I didn't see Kiss at the time. I was only in, you know, fourth grade. When oh my I picked, gosh. I saw the uh, Kiss Alive 2 cover. I think it was the Kiss Alive, op- opening the, uh, the double album, Kiss Alive uh-huh. 2, and seeing the stage with the, with the risers and the flames, and I, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I, uh, I immediately gravitated towards Gene Simmons. And I still do. Huh. I, uh, I'm a huge Kiss fan, and I'm a massive Gene Simmons fan. Uh, I just uh, he he amazes me still to this day. I, I think he's an incredible performer. Mm-hmm. And um, it's interesting yeah, so, you didn't go yeah. with bass. You wanted to play guitar though. So I uh, I remember going to my father. You know, Christmas is coming up. You know, I was like, uh-huh. ah, I want to play bass. And my father says to me, he goes, Why do you want to play bass? 
play guitar, it has two more strings. I was like, okay. So I played guitar, started playing guitar. It was so yeah. simple as that. Wow. Yeah. 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 And then, um, you know, again, coming from a small town, you know, right about my senior year of high school, I knew that I had to do something, uh, for lack of a better word, drastic to, to get out, you know? Uh, so I, I would go into Manhattan a lot. I would, I would go down to Bleecker Street, uh, you know, the, the village, and mm-hmm. I would in with these um, just open jams. I bring a guitar and uh, I got to meet a lot of people that way. And um, I got my, my ass kicked that way too you know, musically. Sure. You know, hanging with these some badass players that just totally just destroy you, which is what you need. You know? Right, right. And uh, yeah, so I met people people there and, uh, and that's how it just started all rolling. And then I, I got to meet this guy, Tony Geranius, who was, his name is Jack Secret, actually. He's Getty Lee's uh, tech for, since uh, for World of Kings tour. Wow. Yeah, up until, up until the end, up until Neil, he lost Neil. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So, so he was playing to like really recent, right? Yeah. So so Jack is is a uh, a very dear friend of mine, and he he kind of took me under under his wing when I was about eighteen years old, and we just started writing songs. He, he lived in Brooklyn, and then uh, before I knew it, uh, he says to me, he goes, uh, he goes, hey, you're you're coming to Greece with me, and we're gonna go to Germany. We're gonna go out with Blue Oyster Cult. You're gonna be a drum tech. This was '86. Uh, Had you yeah. played drums before? Hell no. <laughs> I, no I was like okay you know so now now i'm in greece you know and i'm thrown onto a uh a stage big stage uh blue oyster gold and i got yeah. yeah, i don't know what the hell i'm doing i can't even tune a snare drum and uh, it, it was a joke uh i was horrible i i couldn't have been any worse and i'm to this day i'm still surprised that the drummer ron riddle at the time nice guy he didn't tear my head off Really? Be- I'm surprised he's yeah. not like, wh- who is this guy? Oh. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I, I would have done that in a second because I- I'm a jerk. <laughs> you know? But I, uh, so uh, what happened was uh, the Blue to Cold guys were so nice. You know, Buck Dharma and Eric Bloom and, you know, Ron. I, I, they saw, they saw talent in me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they saw my passion for guitar, electronics. So they, they just moved me to guitar. Oh, and then, wow. Then the world was great. I was, my job was great. I had it all under control. I was doing a really good job and they were happy. And that was wonderful. And then uh, from there, I met uh, this guy, Rick Downey, who was the drummer for Blores to Cult, mm-hmm. uh, Extraterrestrial Live. He was actually a drum tech for Albert Bouchard. And Albert Bouchard didn't show up to a gig one day. Rick got on the drum, didn't play the concert. And then he stayed in that position. Wow. And uh, I'm working with Blue Oyster Cult. Rick came down to a show. At this time now, he's managing, excuse me, he's tour managing Anthrax. I think I met him in San Francisco. A, a couple weeks later, I get a phone call from Rick because I gave him my number before we left. And he called me, he goes, hey man, you want to come to Japan with Anthrax? You know, be Danny Spitz's tech? I'm like, hell yeah. Yeah. So then I was in Japan. We did Japan, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, that was 89. Okay. And that was when I started working with Anthrax. Yeah, so I've known the Anthrax guy since 89. And then, um, yeah, from there, uh, things kind of flaked out with Danny and the guys. And then they called me and I started playing with them. And that took me up to uh, the year 2000. Wow. Well, real quick. So when you were playing guitar, you never, I mean, it sounds like you're writing songs and playing in a in a band like after, after high school, but prior to that, were you just, trying to were you writing a lot or were you trying to learn other people's songs because just yeah. the way that you kind of cut into the industry which is so awesome that you you know you kind of went through the like you were like kind of like a behind the scenes guy right i yeah. mean teching yeah. and 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 yeah. playing guitar and, and and doing these big tours like um was that something that you like once you get that gig are you like this is awesome like i just want to continue to do that or was songwriting or any of that a passion of yours as well that's a great question um, it's an important question. But the main reason that I quit, I, oh. I quit the roadie life, uh, which was difficult because the, uh, you know, I was working a lot. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I was teching for anthrax. 
I was checking for Slayer. Oh, no Michael way. Oh, wow. um, Rat. Uh, who else? I was just in the circle where I was getting a lot of phone calls and I was always busy. I was always on the road. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that my playing was kind of diminishing. Uh, and I wasn't, you know what I mean? I was just like, you know what? I got to get out of here. So I just quit. I mean, I just quit cold and I just started working on my own songs and um, hooked up with a bunch of guys in Jersey mm -hmm. who I still talk to who are my great friends. Uh, Paul Mucci, his name is. And Harry Eckhart, you know, um, our drummer passed away, unfortunately. Oh, man. Actually, our drummer was uh, brought to us by Sebastian Bach. Really? Yeah, he brought us a drummer. His name was Bam Bam. He was a badass, but he passed away uh, probably 15 years ago. Um, but uh, OK, but yeah, so I was getting into songwriting and it was it was very it was metal. You know, mm -hmm. I was attracted to the heavier stuff and I, I like I like darker sounds. Well, you were kind of around that, right? I mean, yeah. the, the bands that you teched for were all heavy, heavier bands. Yeah, but I, I like darker sounds, meaning I, I like uh, I like things that sound evil. You know? <laughs> uh, I love Sabbath, you know? Oh, sure. Maiden, of course, right? I mean, I just love that, yeah. Like, Slayer, like, I mean, to playing yeah, with those guys. Yeah. And... I don't know what it is. I just like it. You know? I, it's funny because I'm a real happy guy. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's a conscious effort. Too, you know, I, I mean, um, I, I, I work at being happy, mm -hmm. you know, to, to wake up and be, be sad or unhappy or just be sorry for yourself, right? <laughs> Especially mm -hmm. today, today, you know. Yeah, it's it's pretty it easy to do that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I didn't mean the name drop here. No, uh, no, this is great. I was talking to Brian May last night, and um, he's a good oh, friend, wow. and. Uh, we're talking about blues guitar and I, I told him honest last night this happened i uh i'm too happy to play blues on top of that i'm also white right I mean, <laughs> sure uh, it doesn't mean that white people can't play blues don't get me wrong look at steve ray vaughn yeah uh eric clapton right um what i'm getting at is that i I try to play blues and I, I suck because I, I, I can't pull from anything. Mm -hmm. I have life experience, obviously, but I, I came from a very nurtured household. I have, uh, I'm very lucky. I still have wonderful parents. Mm -hmm. My brother is awesome. I have a great um, supportive older, older brother. So I'm just a happy guy, you know? So he asked me to play blues. I just can't do it. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I, just, I mean, I've learned all the chops. You know, I mean, you know, I can go in and learn any Albert King thing I need. You know, I can play it. I mean, I'm, I'm capable of playing any blues song I hear. But is it honest? I don't think it's honest. Mm -hmm. So I don't go there because I don't want to insult. You know, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. You, you feel yeah. like, I mean, you're not pulling from the. Yeah, they, they, exactly the same. It's it, maybe it's not as authentic as you'd like it yeah. to be. It's all you that's what I like. Right? You know what I mean? Oh man, that was a little Slayer rift. Yeah, you know, as as opposed to as opposed to like um, you know, or you know, how about how about us? That's amazing. Right. right. Wow. Are you kidding me? How cool is that? But I, I don't write that. You know, I, I write the darker stuff. I, I lean towards the dark stuff. Right? Sure. Wow. Uh, um, it's it's uh, I like that you brought up Brian May in the sense that you yeah. played. Um, I've seen you play because oh. I saw the um, we will we rock, rock you in Vegas. Yeah. And so you must have, did you play that? You must have played the whole residency, I would imagine. Awesome. Yeah. So I saw that. It was so good. At, at, oh. uh, was it the Paris Hotel? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that must great. have been a cool piece thing or a cool thing to be a part of. Like, had you met Brian May at that point? Or, I mean, you kind of took his part, well, right? I bumped into him a few times. We, we did a radio show, Anthrax. We did a radio show in Chicago. And Brian May's uh, solo band was on the bill with us. 
uh, it was a crazy show. It was us, Seven Dust, Brian May, uh, uh, Creed, and Rammstein. Oh, wow. Oh, Rammstein, man. That would have been. Amphitheater in Chicago. And I never heard of Rammstein at this time. Uh, and uh, we'll get back to Brian in a second. Mm-hmm. But I, I uh, Rammstein. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> they were amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, me, me being a Kiss fan, you know, it's right where I wanted to be. I was loving it. And, and I love the whole, the whole German aspect of it. It was so militant. Mm-hmm. And it just makes sense with the music. You know, it, it just works, you know? Uh, yeah, I've never seen them. I've just seen videos on, like, oh, YouTube and stuff. It's insane. It's like, it, oh, my oh, gosh. It is so damn fun. You, you got to go. You, you, you have to go. You, yeah, I want to go. And I see those videos, and I'm like, I need to see this band live. Like this is crazy. It, it, it's perfect. I mean, they bring in everything. They they have they get it right. Meaning <laughs> that the PA, like the PA, is so deafening. I like know? that. Yeah, I mean it's it's like ten times louder than Motorhead. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's loud. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So so Brian May was on that bill, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that was excited as hell i got i uh we uh pulled up in the bus i think we we were coming in from a different show uh, the night before mm-hmm. we got there in the morning I, I remember uh getting up early just wanted to go to to load in and just hang with brian may's tech and i remember getting really excited when i saw the, the brian may road cases coming out you know come out of the truck you know the, yeah the 30 says queen on i'm like oh this is amazing and i, I was so annoying to that tech I, I mean, I drilled him on everything, you know, and, <laughs> and then here comes Brian May, you know, and, and I stood on the side of the stage the whole night, just in awe. And then I took a photo with him. He was great. He was really nice. And then uh, years later, uh, let me see, one, two, six years later, I'm in New Zealand with Meatloaf and we get news that Queen is doing a musical in Vegas mm-hmm. and they're holding open auditions and you have to audition for the guys. And I'm like, wait a minute. I remember talking to Meat about this. I'm going, wait, boss, you're telling me that if I go to Vegas, I can audition and play in front of Brian May. He goes, yeah, <laughs> I'm fucking going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never thought I'd ever get the gig. Honestly, I, I never thought I'd get it, but there was no way I was not going to go. And just to play in front of him, right? Of him. I'm doing this. So I, uh, I reached out to the uh, production company and they gave me my, my time slot for, for audition. You know, I booked my flight, my hotel, and I went out there. And my audition was like a one or noon on a Friday, I forget. Somewhere mm-hmm. around noon o'clock in the afternoon. I got there early, you know, because that's what I do. I wanted to take it in, you know, and I wanted to hear, hear the noises, you know. So I'm sitting in this, there's a small building. It was just a small room where they had, uh, it was a cattle fall. It was like 250 guitar players. Wow. And uh, I don't know, probably 50 piano players, you know, 50 drummers. You know, it was, it was crazy. So I'm hanging out in the lobby and I'm watching these guitar players go into this room. They already have a, like a, a mock-up band put together and they're auditioning guitar players. And um, I'm hearing guitar playing come out and it's horrible. <laughs> every guitar player one after another they all suck and now my chest is starting to expand <laughs> you know i'm like okay i'm feeling pretty good here you know <laughs> you know I, I um they um they sent uh some sheet music it was uh one vision and who wants to live forever these two queen songs that you had to learn to and the uh, the musical was broken down in two, into two guitar parts, the guitar part one and guitar part two. And you were given the option to learn either part to audition. So I, uh, you know, I'm looking at the music and I'm, you know, whatever, looking at the breakdown of it. And I understand how it's broken down. I didn't like it. I, 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 I told Brian this too. Um, I said, this sucks, man. So I played both parts together. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how Brian would have done it. That's how any professional would have done it. You know, why am I, why am I, why am I only going to stick with one little part when there's so much important information over here? You know, 
mm-hmm. really important stuff. I mean, you know, Brian's guitar playing, you change one note, you notice it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, um, let me see. If I do a... Are you hearing this? Yeah. So like, um, you know, like the Queen stuff, you know, uh, we were rocking. You know, you change any of those notes, it doesn't sound like it, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to change any. Uh, anyway, so I go in, uh, I walk in the room, and I'm I'm feeling pretty confident now. Real quick, this is a great story. I'm just, I'm just curious yeah. on the so you you said that there you could pick one one or two guitar parts, right? There's two pieces that you could play. Yeah. What in 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 from the Queen song is this? If you saw Queen live or whatever, would Brian Brian May would play both those parts? anyway Absolutely. right yeah so he, it, it's not like he, some guy standing behind the 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 amps is doing the other piece at their show he's doing all of that anyway so the fact that you're going in and being like i'm just gonna play both of them because that's what he would do like yeah. i'm sure that just set you know obviously set you apart from everybody else okay so i just want to clarify that this yeah. isn't this was no, written not- the way it was written was as as one person could do it but they're splitting it up Coming across over the phone. It wasn't because I was talking, probably. You know, like... That's one vision, right? Beautiful. Uh-huh. You know, uh, the solos uh, too. Like I just, um, I just made a composite of the parts. Mm-hmm. Now I walk in the room. And now, now I'm pissed off uh, because I don't see Brian or Roger. Oh. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm tight. I'm, I'm, I'm. I can swear here, right? I think I. Yeah, yeah. Swear. You say whatever the hell you want. Adam, I'm fucking furious. All right. Uh, this, this is bullshit. All right. I come all this way. I was like, fuck all of you. Honestly, I was like, I was like, fuck, in, internally, you know. Uh huh. I was like, oh, you know. So I turn around to the amps. And I brought a little, uh, like a little effects process. I plugged it in, and it was two amps. I used both amps. You know, I just plugged in. I used both. I was going, "Fuck, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow this." Yeah, you because know, I said, "You know, just plug in." I'm like, "All right, I use both amps." <laughs> All right, so I uh, we started, and um, I think we started with one vision, the lick, and um, I wasn't quite loud enough. So I just, I remember playing. I was just playing the riff. As I'm turning around, not, not even looking at the neck, I'm playing the riff and I'm just turning up the amps, turning the knobs as I'm playing. Like this, right? And I remember turning around and the guys behind the desk, they're like, like all shocked, you know, because I wasn't missing any notes. Mm-hmm. And then they, just, they stopped. They said, stop, like this. Can you come back on Monday? I must have played 90 seconds. And I said, yeah, I can come back on Monday. You know, I was like, all right, I'll stay in Vegas for the weekend. Mm-hmm. Not a total bust. You know, even though Brian are on here, hey, I'll come back. So Monday comes around and I get a, I get a text on Sunday night, need a Bally's convention center, for a different place. All right. So uh, I go into Monday. It's a big convention room now. And uh, you're not allowed inside it. And outside of it, just lines of musicians and lines of guitar players. They all, they all have the guitars out and they're all playing the stuff. Yeah, practicing. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't break my guitar until I went in the room and I didn't go into the room until the very end of the day. I was the last you just person hanging out out there waiting. Frustrating. Oh, I was the God. last person to play all day. And uh, I was there for probably six hours. And, um, you know, again, so I'm, I'm listening to all the guitar players and it sucks, man. Like no one can rock. I don't know what the problem is in Vegas. You know, we're the rock guys. No one came out <laughs> there. You know, I have a few friends there that are great, you know. Uh, all right, so I go in the room and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't set this up. When I'm waiting outside, Brian and Roger come in. Yeah, like, oh, this is great. They're here. I was really excited. That's why I didn't leave. Right. So you saw them yeah. early on? Yeah, I saw them at the beginning of the day. If, okay. If I didn't know that they were there. I wouldn't have hung out. Right. Because all I was saying was bullshit in that room. You know, this, I'm out of here, right? So um, I, I finally get the call. I go in. There's Brian and Roger. 
and they're sitting behind this long table with a uh, bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I broke out my guitar. I think I had a, a B-series Mockingbird. It had a bunch of you know buttons and switches on it. And actually, Brian came over to me. And he's just, I mean, he's a tall guy, you know, and he starts talking mm-hmm. to me. I don't know why. He's only talking to me. He's not talking to anybody else. And he's looking at the guitar, and he's asking questions about the guitar. And I was telling him what it was doing, the sounds, and he goes, oh, it's really nice. And he goes, go on up. And I went up, and we, uh, we played One Vision again. I did the intro. I hit the intro, and I looked up at Brian and Roger, and they both high five right, at the table. So I felt pretty good, mm-hmm. all right? Oh, it's coming into the guitar solo. And there's this long interlude, uh, probably 45 second keyboard interlude. And all right, so I'm just taking a deep breath, getting ready for the solo. And then Brian May stands up and he walks over to me. And I was standing right in front of me as I'm about to hit the solo. And I, I mean like two feet. And as I'm about to hit it, he leans down, looks right at the guitar neck at my hand. Now he's a foot from my guitar neck as I'm playing a solo. One of his solos. Yeah. That was a that was an audition. <laughs> I was gonna say that must have been terrifying. Yeah, yeah. I hit it though, thankfully. And I he he, he stepped back and he goes, Cool. He goes, I couldn't quite hear you back there. And he turned around and went back to the table. Whoa. Yeah, and then uh that was it. They said thank you very much, and I left. And uh I'm at a bar with my, my drummer John Michelli, he was also in the band. John Michelli play drums in we're rocky and he plays drums in in meatloaf he got the gig before i did he was already in the, he was already in it you know oh so he was, knew he had I, got it he was, he was the best drummer it was, it was it was it was ridiculous how he dominated and uh he was already in so it was it made it easy for me because i was auditioning with him mm-hmm. it felt good to play with john obviously so john and i are walking now to i uh, want to go to grab some dinner and my phone rings Hey, can you come back tomorrow? I said, absolutely. Thank you. He goes, uh, can you please tell John? I said, John's right here. I gave John the phone. We'll see you tomorrow. Great. Uh, tomorrow comes, I go in. Now there's maybe six guitar players at about 250 from Friday. This is Tuesday. And uh, again, I wait the entire time until the very end, and they call me up. We played uh, Who Wants to Live Forever? And that's a beautiful song. Uh, um, challenging guitar parts. We played it. Uh, Brian and Roger clapped. Thank you very much. And they left the room. Uh, a couple weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, you want to move to Vegas? I was like, great. I moved to Vegas. Yeah. And that that's the queen. Wow. <laughs> and then, okay, yeah, geez. And they made you wait that long? They made you sweat it out for a couple weeks, too? They tell your drummer you're in, and they're like, "Well, we're gonna wait a couple of weeks to, <laughs> to, to confirm your 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 buddy." Um, but that's that's wild, man. I can't imagine having you know. Not only are you playing his, Brian May's song, but he's standing there, like probably just making sure you're hitting the right note. Like, does this guy really know exactly what I was playing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. I just think that's that's. That, that's crazy that you were able to do that. Um, I love, wow. Yeah, so, so um, well, I want to talk to you about this, this album that you guys put out, the, yeah. the Meatloaf uh, record. So tell me, how does this come together? Uh, what's kind of the, the I, you know, why do, you, why do you go about and do, why did you guys go about doing this? And then how did you link up with, um, with uh, Caleb? Sorry, I had a brain fart there. You're right. Um, Meatloaf passed out on stage in Edmonton, Canada in 2016. Uh, I played with Meatloaf for just over 20 years. And every concert, he passes, he passed out. Really? At every concert I ever played with him, he's on the ground there for the show. Either he's on the side of the stage or he's behind the stage. He's, he's on the ground flat taking oxygen. Every concert, this concert, he dropped on stage during Anything for Love. And uh, when he went down, uh, 
honestly, none of us were really alarmed because we see it all the time. Uh-huh. All right. He goes down. I remember watching him because I was watching, right? And playing. I'm looking at you go. He goes down. I'm like, well, he's not getting up. I go, like, oh, shit. I put my guitar down and his assistant runs out. Okay. The short of it, uh, show is actually over. He's taken to the hospital. Uh, uh, from there, the uh, we had a braver we had the braver than we are tour set up. It was already on sale in the UK and Europe. It was the record that I uh, produced for him. Mm-hmm. That tour got canceled because from the pass out, Meat went into a couple back surgeries, and he never came out of it. Still, I mean, up until we lost him, he never came out of it pain. So he says to me, "Hey, Paul, give me to December." Again, this is June of 2016. We're in Canada and he passed out. I said, yeah, no problem, boss. You know, take care of yourself. And, you know, now it's Christmas and he's not ready. Paul, I need till summer. Okay, boss. You know, coming May now, June, he's nowhere near ready and he's in a lot of pain. I mean, tremendous pain. Mm-hmm. And now I'm getting phone calls from the band. You know, what are we doing? We need work. You know, I'm losing the guys. I was like, I was panicking. You know, I'm the music director. Like, what am I going to do if I lose the guys? I mean, this music is not easy, Adam. I mean, this isn't ACDC. Right. Yeah. Um, it's not the Rolling Stones. You know what I mean? This is this is intricate stuff. It's very deep, big chords, man. Yeah, trying to find somebody that could fill those shoes to play. Well, also, somebody who wants to play that. Oh, sure. Honestly, I remember, you know, because we... You know, being in the band for all that time, we went through a lot of auditions for musicians. And this is commonplace. Learn Bad of the Hell, learn Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Every time, man, they would come in with the dog ate my homework excuse. Oh, There's no interesting. time to learn a 15 minute song for an audition. It's very difficult to find players. It really, really was. So uh, I'm like, oh my God. I'm losing the band. That's it. I'm going on tour. I'm, I'm getting this band together. We're going to go out. We're going to play meatloaf songs. I'm going to find another singer. And the whole reason for this was because I saw it as at any time when meat's ready, he can simply hop on a plane and join us. And it turns into a meatloaf show immediately. And there's no pressure, meaning that he could show up unannounced. And if at four o'clock, all of a sudden, he has incredible pain. He doesn't have to perform because no one knows he's there. Oh, sure. Okay. And that was everything for him. The pressure of it. That's what drove him crazy. Because mm-hmm. every day he woke up with some kind of ailment. His back, whatever, his knees, you know. He was a big guy. He carried a lot of weight his whole life. He beat himself up. Okay. A lot of discomfort this man had. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right. So, I talked to Matt. I called management to tell him the idea. And they're like, yeah, sounds great. Good luck. You know, meaning, you know, sarcastic, you know, right. talking to the boss. You know, he's very alpha male. Uh, so I dial the phone and I'm pretty nervous to Adam. <laughs> I call the boss with this idea. Hey, boss. You know, we're talking. I said, hey, so, you know, I want to go out in the road with the band because we're going to lose them. And I told him the whole premise of it. You can come in at any time. That's how I'm seeing it. And I want to find another singer and go out and do it. And uh, he was quiet for like 10 seconds like the longest 10 seconds of my life mm-hmm. and then he just goes he goes yeah okay and he goes well who are you going to get to sing and i said i have no fucking idea i'm just telling you my idea right now i'm just giving you my thoughts and what i need to do mm-hmm. to keep in together so once i got his blessing i went out and found i went out for the for the vocal search right the vocal guy the lead singer excuse me and uh so i put together the one sheet it's called right and mm-hmm. i just started out to, to my agency friend and i went across the desk of uh caleb's agent and next thing i know i get a phone call from his agent and uh then i call caleb i get his number and i call caleb and then uh a few weeks after that he's in new jersey and we're tracking bad of the hell so this record was done four years ago oh wow okay this so he meat, meat love was still around at this point yeah, I, I had to set it. I had to set it up. I'm sorry, it took a while. Um, it's important that 
everyone that's viewing this knows we're not capitalizing on the loss of our boss. We've been doing this for four years. And um, when we lost him, we just kicked into a higher gear, meaning we looked at the recording because we were just using it for demos. We were using it to, to do uh, commercial adverts and, and basically uh, so that people, they, they could buy it. It was more of a, uh, a soundtrack. You know how you go to like a musical on Broadway? Mm -hmm. If shop, you buy a soundtrack. You know, you, you want to take home what you listen to or you purchase a soundtrack before you go. So, you know, if you, you want to make sure you like it. Right. right. Like if you so, bought the American Idiot soundtrack, knowing that, exactly. I mean, yeah, you're not yeah. you're not this buying the record. You're buying the yeah. soundtrack to the musical, which is an adaptation of the. That's of the exactly. Yeah. That's how we saw this. Because it wasn't Meatloaf singing. Right. It was just, oh, it was a soundtrack. We lost our boss. The recordings are great. You know what? Let's go in and remix this stuff. Let's take a lot of time on it. Let's re-record re re some things that we a little quick on. And let's take a good hard look at the artwork because Meatloaf loved his album covers. He took a lot of pride in album covers. And we knew that was important. You know, so we, we uh, went back and remix, we re remixed it. We recorded some vocal things here or there um, and designed some beautiful artwork with uh, Deco Records. And uh, what you're hearing now, again, is a, uh, a project that was four years old that is now given a new uh, glaze, <laughs> a new mastering, you know, and, mm -hmm. it's, and it's brilliant. Have you heard it? Yeah, I have. I had a chance to hear it. Yeah, it's great. No, it really is great. I was I didn't know what I was going to expect. And then, I mean, Caleb is such a perfect uh, what he's he's like perfect for that role, too. He even has kind of the meatloaf like look to him. You know what I mean? It's funny when, when he was on American Idol, they were comparing him to meatloaf. And it got to be such a joke that when he won meatloaf went on social media, you can find it. He's on his Facebook. He says, he says, thank you, everybody. I did not win American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, because he, he has a similar look and his voice, everything. It's just yeah. like he's like the perfect person yeah. uh, to do it and to, to art and to be vetted by by me love before, you know, not it's not like, you know, you guys, like you said earlier, which I thought was really amazing like and, and important, like you said, to say is that this has already been something that was going on for four years. It wasn't that, you know, we're even if you were, you know, you guys worked with him forever and it was like even if you're paying you know, respect to him and, and whatever. Like, Milov knew that Caleb was singing these songs way well before. For four years. Yeah. So, and the fact that he had, you know, vetted him and gave him the blessing well before anything had happened with him, that's pretty incredible. And to make it even more supportive, the very last show that I performed at Meatloaf was the Huckabee show. The TV show mm -hmm. out of Henderson, Hendersonville. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, Hendersonville and Nashville, or like outside yeah. Nashville. It's uh, Governor Mike Huckabee, his show. Yeah. And uh, we performed uh, Out of the Frying Pan, Los Angeles Loser, and Mercury Blues. And uh, Caleb joined us on that. Wow. It's on YouTube. We type Meatloaf Huckabee, you'll see Caleb singing. Yeah, so he, he loved Caleb that much that he wanted to bring him on the stage. With him. That's incredible. Yeah, so this is a family, okay? There's, there's no bullshit here. This, mm -hmm. this show has Meat Love DNA in it. You know? This yeah. Is his, uh, the show, this is his show, meaning that we're following all the rules that he set up for us. He put the set list together for us. I was going to ask about that. So he had his hands in everything from yes. the, uh, the beginning of this, the whole project. So. Yeah. Yes. He, so involved that we even brought in his business manager to take care of the money so that oh, me, wow. so that me saw where all the money was going. That's, uh, that, that's great that he, I mean, to be, he's so supportive and he was able to kind of be with you all through the whole process of this. 
And then now you're celebrating him with all these live shows coming up. You've done one, right? The Atlantic City, uh, the release of the record. And then you've got a, a bunch coming up, right? And then uh, end of March and May and some, you're going across the, in the, you know, to UK and playing some shows there in May. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're going to fill out the rest of the year too. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, some information from our booking agent, you know, for the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is it playing? I mean, that must be pretty, especially for you and, and in the rest of the guys that have been playing with Meatloaf for so long. That must be really an, an emotional moment. I mean, getting up there, especially on that record release show and playing those songs and, and just kind of knowing the hard work that you guys have put into the, you know, celebrating him, but not only that, being a part of his life for so long and then having him a part of the project for so long. The, um, the first show back after we lost him was, was that was heavy. I bet. I remember um, I, I totally broke down at Soundcheck when we did anything for love. Uh -huh. It's a mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So live now, uh, yeah, I feel it at times, and, and I, I talk to him during the show. If I hit a mistake, I apologize. Him. Um, and um, you know, it's funny, it's like during two out of three, the song two out of three, I can't look at John, our drummer. I still, I haven't been able to still. Wow. I probably never will. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't even imagine. But I mean, uh, yeah, because the, uh, the rest of the guys, you and the rest of the guys have been with, with him for a long, long time, correct? Yeah. John's been with him since 92, since anything fell out. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he saw the whole blow up. It was he came in the band and they were doing you know clubs, and all of a sudden anything of a love hit, boom! Now they're on the Concord, going back and forth to Britain every weekend to play Top of the Pops, you know. Yeah, and, and uh, now, now they're at Wembley, you know, doing thirty nights at Wembley, you know. When when I first joined the band, we did four nights at Wembley. Jeez. Yeah. He's, it is interesting to look at his career and see that. You know, because Bad Out of Hell came out in like the late seventies, and that's still a—I mean, that's an amazing record, and it, it got a lot of praise, and it sold a bunch of records, and it was a big album. But then to what, like you know, ten or it had to be a, like you're looking at like fifteen years later that he had, that he has this song that just you know stands the test of time and it becomes this massive hit to to push him even further uh it's 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 interesting to see and and like there's not a whole lot of stories like that i don't think that's great it's a great story because um even when um oh fuck you know i, I was there in the hospital with me uh the day before he passed oh, and, uh, even then you know, talking to John, we didn't count him out. You can't, you could, you could never count the guy out. He always came back. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, man. And like you said, like Bad Out of Hell 2 was an amazing, amazing comeback. I mean, who does that? Because <laughs> you have, oh, you have Bad Out of Hell, which was in the top five greatest selling albums of all time. Mm -hmm. Right? It's changed. We know this because records don't sell anymore. Right. So he's up there with thriller and rumors and back in black, right? He's right there. Right. Right. And then anything for love comes and he sells 26 million units. You know, it's insane. Who the hell who the hell does that? You know, so you can never count the guy out. You know, and he's always and then after that he's making all these great movies. You know, he has 60 films under his belt. Yeah, he was a great actor. He was in some yeah. really good films. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't even I forgot about so, that. So, like he so good at acting. Um, like he, he would, um, he was very proud of his acting, uh, and he, he enjoyed it. I, I, he enjoyed acting more than music, honestly. He, because uh, even a concert was a movie to him. He would the way he put a, a concert together was it was like watching a movie. Uh -huh. The intro credits, the peaks and valleys, and then the outro credits. That's how we did a concert. Mm -hmm. and that's how we do our shows too. Again, we, our show is a meatloaf thought process. And uh, he, um, what I'm getting at was that. 
he loved his acting so much. He was never ashamed of it. Meaning, you know, you know, some people don't like to talk about themselves or show you things. He always wanted to show you what he's doing. And it was fun, you know, because he wasn't conceited. He was genuinely excited to show you. Mm-hmm. So you know, this, you know what I mean? He's like a kid. So we get on the bus and he get his, uh, his, uh, you know, demo copy of a new movie, whatever it was. Let's watch it. Like, yeah, we're watching it. You know, and we'd watch a new movie with him on the bus and you'd, you would forget it was him. Yeah. That's how great of an actor he was. I remember, uh, yeah, the first time I realized he was in a film or he was in Wayne's World, but that I didn't put it all together really until uh, he was in Fight Club. Because it's like, what? I remember watching Fight Club, I think it was my dad. And he was like, that, that Meatloaf? And I'm like, that's not me. You know, and having to go back and be like, holy shit, it is Meatloaf. Like, this is crazy. Yeah, he cut his hair for that film, I think, right? Yeah. And he never cut He never grew it back. <laughs> oh, is it. that? Oh, yeah. He always had, he did have short hair later after that. But yeah, in oh, that yeah. film, I forgot that. Yeah, he did. Because I didn't even recognize him. I'm like, that's not, yeah. no, that's not Meatloaf. Yeah, I, from that point on where he had short hair and he's, of short hair i remember we did a um we did a uh a variety show in germany it's called uh vet and dust mm-hmm. and it was it was a cool bill it's like the, it's like the greatest variety show in europe and it was us it was uh it was during the time of tom hanks and leo dicaprio catch me if you can movie oh right okay so it was spielberg uh, uh directed that so um they were there the three of them us uh, faith hill uh, Christina Aguilera, Tom Jones, and uh, Hugh Grant. And I'm, there was this, this green room. And uh, I remember walking in with Meatloaf to the green room, and there's Faith Hill, right? Where she's <laughs> like, woo, gorgeous. And uh, Meat goes up to her. And I, I remember hearing her clear, clear as a bell. She goes, where did your long hair go? And she's looking, where's your long hair? You know, he's like, I cut it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I didn't realize that that he because he did cut it for the movie because there's yeah. a great scene where he's like hugging uh, uh, Edward Norton. Right. Um, can- and then that's and I'm like, there's no way that's me. Love. And then you go back and watch and it, it is. But he does. Yeah, he has short hair. And, you're, and that's where the disconnect for me came. And I didn't realize that he never grew it back after that. That's fascinating. Oh, you froze up on me. Am I frozen too? There you are. You were frozen, yeah. I was so just saying you? that there's that great scene from Fight Club where, where Milo's hugging uh, Edward Norton, you know, right? He's like, he's got him like this. And then, like, I didn't think about, you know, that's him. But that's where my dad was like, yeah, that's him. And I'm like, no way. Or whatever, because he always had the long hair. And then I didn't realize that from there on out, he never cut. He always just kind of kept it short. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Wow. Well, uh, so I'm sure that the album release show. Went... Oh, can you hear me? Nothing. Hello. Hello. Gotcha. Oh, you got me. Okay, cool. Yeah. I only got a couple. I only have, you know, a couple, uh, another question or so here. I'm just curious. Uh, so like going out and to play the album release show, I'm sure that was incredible. And then you guys have these shows coming up in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, getting, it's cool to hear that you had Caleb before, everything you know before he he ended up passing and all that stuff so um i'm just curious like like are you like how, these shows must be aside from emotional like super exciting like are the fans there you could tell that they've just been milo fans forever oh yeah it's, it's beautiful it's it's every show is is usually beautiful we start the show with a an 11 minute memorial video oh wow and uh and that's great and when that finishes you know everybody's cheering yeah you know Mm -hmm. and then uh as we go through the show uh we come to a song called heaven can wait and uh we decided to keep that instrumental Mm -hmm. and uh what we do is we put the mic stand the mic stand out there with the red scarf and we spotlight it and then we play heaven can wait and then during that song, we run a, uh, a photo compilation video uh, that starts with Meat Love as an infant. Wow. Yeah. So um, we're doing everything we can to celebrate him. This, you know, it, this show is about him. 
we never lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I, I hopefully you guys take it. I mean, you don't, you only have a couple dates here in the States from what I saw. Right uh, yeah. I hope you guys come and play uh, a couple more here in the States. So I have a chance to check out the show. Cause it just sounds so amazing. Oh yeah. And, and, um, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for doing this, Paul. This has been great. Right on. Right on, I love Adam. hearing these stories and, and just your, your career is so cool and so fascinating. Um, but I have one more quick question. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists, songwriters, musicians? Yeah. Um, let me quote a couple of people. I'd love it. David Bowie. Always keep yourself a little bit off the ground where you just barely touch as far as your comfort zone. Okay. Don't ever be too comfortable in what you're doing because you can't grow. And I, I, that's a mantra for me. And I, I do that even with the guys I play with. Every person I play with is better than me. Always. Uh, I am the weak link in, in the Neverland Express. I'm always coming up the back end. These guys kick my ass, right? That's the only way to do it. Because uh, otherwise, why? You know, you, you always want to push yourself, right? So, um, D. Snyder. He said, uh, I think he said, uh, the only reason why bands don't make it is because they break up. <laughs> you know, if, if you can stay together long enough, you're going to make a noise, you know? So just stick it out, work hard, stay out of your comfort zone. And if I can add to that myself, my own personal experience is uh, keep your fucking mouth shut. Okay. Don't say, don't say stupid shit. Uh, be friendly. And the most important thing on tour is, is getting together. I mean, I'm sorry, getting along. Okay. And this sounds weird. I might catch some flack for this. Musicianship is secondary to vibe. Okay, so... If you're with a bunch of guys, in our case, a bunch of guys and a few girls, the vibe is great. It's going to be great. You know, if your vibe is shit, you're going to make shit music. You're not going to last. You're going to break. Okay. So surround yourself with, with loving people who understand how to talk to each other and, you know, and who are respectful, you know, and that's how a band stays together. You know, you look at the guys, you know, um, like when I see like James Hetfield, you know, talking to Lars, it's really amazing how he handles Lars, you know, I don't know if you've, you've caught this, uh, James is, he's brilliant, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like he's like, ah, he's, he's, he freaks me out. He's so amazing. But I, I remember seeing, uh, videos. I'm a big Metallica fan, obviously, you know, you know, where Lars just kind of go off, they will spat off at the guys, you know, kind of complain or yell and James will, uh, diffuse it in a second it's brilliant uh, i can't give you an example i'm sorry mike did i lose you there you see me just for a second oh. yeah um uh, you'll find it like you go to like the um the backstage stuff that you do before showing the jamming in the jam room you'll see it what i'm talking about james is like the great equalizer <laughs> yeah you know he understands you know it's, it's about the vibe man mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that. And I, and I completely agree. So I've heard other artists talk about not what you just said, but just in the sense that like, when you have to replace a member, or you're getting someone else, you know, maybe you don't pick the guy that is the shredder of all shredders, but it's a guy that maybe, you know, already gets along with everybody maybe is like you like you've had those instances getting you've got a lot of jobs as a guitar tech for different bands. And it's probably just relationships. Not that you're not an insane good guitar player, but that's you already right. have the the you know the leg up just knowing that oh this guy's cool like he's already working with all these other cool bands that we think are cool so he must be cool to be able to hang out with them all the time and get along with them like it's almost like yeah you have to have I, just to kind of you know add to what you're i mean just you know double dip on what you're saying just kind of you know it is that i feel like i've heard a lot of people say that yeah, where it's, it's like not, yeah it's all networking you know making right. friends and um uh so I lost my train of thought here. I was on a, on a, uh, I wanted to expand on this. It was, it was a 
something was cool. I'll come back to it if I can remember. remember no, it. you're talking about, sorry, I cut you off. Um, uh, James Hetfield talking about Lars yeah. and the, the, um, the vibe. I'm sorry. It's just um, surrounding yourself with good people. You know, um, yeah, you know, be the best you can be, you know, you know and Meatloaf taught me that too. Um, every day, uh, I do this every night. I'm not kidding. As I'm, as I'm, you know, climbing to the bed, as I'm, you know, settling in, I, I look at my day and I, I, I think about what I accomplished in the day. And did I take a step forward? I do all those conscious thoughts every night. And I can honestly say every day I step forward. You know, whether it's a baby step or not, it doesn't matter. And by stepping forward, I mean learning something, getting better at something, uh, whatever it is, you know, just moving forward in your career, you know. Um, and uh, believe it or not, doing good deeds. Uh, just smiling, you know. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, you know, several homeless people around this area, you know, and just buying them coffee or dinner really you know, it, it, uh, it, it helps you, it, it makes you happy and uh, inspires me to do better work. You know, so if, if I see a buddy of mine, a homeless guy who was, you know, they're my friends, you know, they're nice people, you know, uh, I'll buy him a cup of coffee or something, whatever I can, you know, a jacket and it gets cold, you know, um, I come back to the studio and I'm, I'm amped up. I'm excited. I feel great. Makes me want to work. Yeah.